my name is Ulrich Matejek. Uh, I started working for as a security consultant for a company called Eaters. Most of you have probably not heard about that. It's a subsidiary of Bosch. We do a lot of stuff for the automotive world, but since I'm part of Bosch, um, I can also work on some interesting IoT Linux pro uh, projects they're doing. And this is why I'm here with my colleague, Philip. Yeah, and I just surely jump in. So I'm the sidekick of Ulrich. I'm not the security guy. I'm working more in safety critical systems, but I would like to tell a personal story from what I've experienced with security and automotive in the past. So I guess we jump over to this. Uh, yeah. So as said, ETAS is a subsidiary of Bosch and supports us. I'm mainly in an activity called Embedded IoT Linux at Bosch. Linux was strong in automotive, but we also find it in many other devices. And we said it's, we see that many, many projects are utilized. So if someone wants to grab a sticker, we have some of them available. But what may be more interesting is that we see that a Linux system comprised of many, many different elements. And even if you don't share the same code base to any extent, you often share the same problems. And the problems are not only within Bosch, but they are also within other areas. To just get a very rough idea on what kind of products we are building within Bosch, because some know this from the, maybe from your home appliances or from some power tools which you're using, but actually we are in a vast amount of industries and even if the pictograms here of the products not all run Linux in this explicit product, there's always Linux running in these devices and device classes are also sometimes in Artos, but all of them get connected to the network. So it's all an IoT device. And bringing this together, we see that well, in the past, 10 years back, we just built products which were there standalone, but IoT devices are connected, right? And this means you even have to secure them in a better way because the attack surface gets much longer. And now it comes to my personal story. So um, I'm mainly working for Bosch since 15 years, and when I really started in, the, in a platform, we came to first time have a multi-core processor, and in this one, we wanted to get in Linux to do our navigation, certain animations, had a G 3D GPU rendering, and this was in the range of 2010. And I don't know who of you have worked on things like Secure Boot in 2010 already? Oh, that's very good. It would have loved to have you in here. And I guess you also said uh, in your previous talk, if I would have known, it would have been smarter 10 years back, right? And that's where we came from. We were completely new to Linux. We got um, support from other companies and there, which were in the field of Linux products. And well, we started off with the 2634 kernel, put it on a device. It was not a connected device. And the good thing is we already had certain things in mind to say, how do we make things proper handover? What are real time? What are important system functionalities? Who had some security ideas or prevention in mind that you don't get into a system? So we have a real time or as separated from the um, real operating system Linux, the infotainment part. But what I didn't expect is how much creativity people bring to just try to hack such such a system. Uh, and what I became aware of this, that I still find people in posts on Reddit from 2021 or so, where people just hacked a device which we developed in 2010 or the base hardware software for it. And that actually, I put the timelines here for the different kernels. So you can see that there are cars around released in the age of 2018 with a 2634 kernel because we never thought about updates and so on. And if you would like to see what is all possible, I mean, it still means you need to dismount this device from the car, open it, attach certain parts. It's a multi-level intrusion part on it. And then at the end, you need to solder some wires to get to the terminal. But uh, then you're basically done. So if you look for the password of the root, we found it easier for developer for not having one. So you just have a root user. You don't have password in there. You just get to the terminal. That's how we started development. And we never evolved from this. And a long time ago, so it was 2010, and I guess Ulrich would give us 
some ideas on what we're doing these days, nowadays. So, we'll back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, mean, uh, I don't think I need to tell you about the importance of secure boot, of a verified boot process. Um, for Bosch, it's mainly about warranty issues and having their re reputation ruined by people executing doom on a wall scammer or something. Um, but even though there's a lot of IoT pro uh, projects going on, uh, still basically each of them has to reinvent the wheel when it comes to securing their boot process. And uh, recently I was involved in, process, in a project where we try to like, give them a head start, give them um, a blueprint they can follow to um, implement secure boot so they don't have to research the options themselves, decide which approach to take. And um, basically what I'm doing today is just taking you along on this journey um, on the different options we evaluated and um, what basically is in our toolbox that we try to provide to the projects to help them focus on generating the, the actual functions they, they want to implement and not on uh, securing the, the boot process. Um, yeah, okay, I already told you that. Um, when you look at a boot process, you usually what you want to do is um, you want to build a chain of trust that starts somewhere in your hardware, in your system on a chip, microcontroller, uh, microprocessor, whatever. Um, that verifies um, the bootloader and then starts executing it. The bootloader um, verifies and executes the kernel or maybe even your initial RAMFS. And um, then you want to extend this chain of trust into the root file system so you can be sure that the actual software running on your IoT system is that which you ship with it. Um, a little bit disconnected from that, you see uh, you also need to do updates, especially in the connected world of today. So any system we, can, uh, we come up with for securing the boot process um, also needs to be somehow um, compatible with whatever update system the, the project um, decided to use. Um, when we were talking to the projects, we noticed that they um, want to like have strong control over what they were doing with their system on a chip. So all we could do there is provide them some guidance on how to um, implement the root of trust in that uh, system on a chip. And also, um, all of them were using the Apertis Linux distribution. They wanted to use an upstream kernel without any modifications. So this was also something we could not touch. Um, so our, our blueprint basically focuses on the bootloader and how to um, uh, secure the file system itself. Um, uh, the first building block, the bootloader, um, basically all projects were already working with U-Boot. Um, we heard also a little bit about that yesterday. Um, it's immensely popular, it has a large community, it uh, supports a huge amount of features, um, but if you haven't done it, it's also maybe a little bit challenging to configure it securely. But the uh, most important part is that it supports something called signed fit images, which is basically a file containing the kernel, your um, initial RAMFS, other configuration data, and you can pick a number of these and sign them so you can be sure that they haven't been tampered with. Um, however, we want also wanted to provide another um, bootloader for the projects to use. Uh, so we uh, took a look at Rust Boot, the probably up-and-coming star on the bootloader firmament, um, which just has, has a very minimal feature set. Uh, it can just load and execute the kernel or or the uh, initial RAMFS along with it, but it needs to become uh, needs to come from a signed fit image. So if the fit image isn't signed, or the signature doesn't verify, uh, Rust boot will just not load um, and execute your kernel. And um, since it also supports doing updates in a very simple fashion, uh, we thought this might be interesting, not to projects that are already on the way, but maybe to future projects. So we included that in our uh, blueprint. 
Now, the second and more important part was like how to make sure your root file system hasn't been tampered with. Um, the most obvious solution is somehow make it read only, but that also creates additional uh, challenges because the Linux kernel would very much like to write to at least some of the, uh, the directories. Thank you very much. Um, and obviously, having a read only file system prevents you from, from doing updates and also might not. Pr uh, uh, help you against offline attacks where somebody just tampers with the file system while your device is switched off. Um, another me measure is the Linux integrity measurement architecture um, that uh, stores uh, authentication data or integrity data in extended file attributes, so it's wonderfully compatible with update systems that work on a file base. Um, but it did not seem immensely popular, and so we looked at the third option, which is the DM Verity kernel module. Uh, as the name already implies, it uses the device mapper to provide you with read-only access to a file system, but each time you try to read a block from that device, um, DM Verity actually performs an integrity measurement by hashing that and comparing the value uh, to that stored in a hash tree and effectively try, uh, tie the um, hash of, or the contents of the block you're reading to one root of your hash tree. So you just need to provide the hash tree itself and the root hash to the Verity to secure your whole file system. Um, and this third option was the one we included in our blueprint, so we told our projects to um, use that. And, um, for doing that, basically you have two phases. During the preparation phase, which usually happens uh, somewhere in your build pipeline, you take the file system, you compute the hash tree, and um, from the root of that hash tree, you can take the root hash. And um, when your device is running um, and an I.O. request is processed by the kernel, it's passed on the, to the DM Verity kernel module, which then uses all the data the block read from the file system, your hash tree, and the root hash um, to basically decide, has this block been tampered with? And if so, then you can perform some other error handling like rebooting your system, freezing your system, or just logging an error. Otherwise, the read proceeds as, as you know it. The interesting question, and this is what we had to cover in our blueprint, is how do you get from the preparation to the operation phase? And for this, there are also basically two to three options. The first one is to um, just include the root hash into so somewhere in the, the initial RAMFS or in the uh, kernel, kernel parameters. So just put it somewhere in your fit image where it is signed and also protect against tam tampering. Um, and in this case, um, you can just for example, put it into the, the uh, kernel uh, boot parameters, and then the kernel will take that data, uh, set up the Verity, mount the root file system, and um, you have extended your chain of trust basically from the bootloader via the fit image straight to the file system. Unfortunately, when you're working with the Apertis distribution, that's, that requires modifying the kernel uh, configuration which was not an option for our projects, so we uh, could not use that approach. Um, the second approach would be to um, store, for example, your um, root hash somewhere in, in the initial RAMFS and um, use that for mounting the file system. Um, that brings some, some penalty in terms of boot time with it, but it does not require modifying the kernel. And in the end, this was, was what most of our project chose. Um, this is um, similar to the first approach in that you also extend the chain of trust straight from the bootloader to your root file system because the root hash to which the authenticity of the, the file system is tied is verified by the bootloader because it's the bootloader that checks the fit image and authenticates either the kernel command line or the initial RAMFS where this data is stored. 
Um, there's also a third option in which you um, just sign the root hash with, um, a, pu with a, a private key and you store the public key somewhere in your kernel in the trusted key ring. And then um, when loading uh, the, or when, when setting up the Inverity, the Inverity uses this uh, key from the kernel key ring to authenticate the root hash and then load the file system. Um, this is conceptually different a little bit from the first two approaches because um, in this case, uh, you have an additional link in your chain of trust. You do not extend the chain from the bootloader straight to the file system, but to the kernel and then from the kernel to the file system itself. And um, for this, there are also two options. Either you do just by passing the correct parameters to the kernel, or you use an initial RAMFS. However, as I already told you, um, since uh, our projects didn't want to use a customized kernel, um, this whole approach was, was not an option for us. Um, but anyway, uh, no matter which way you take, you end up with an authenticated root file system that, however, is read-only. So um, in the end, what you need to do is at least uh, add a couple of overlay FS mounts to enable write access to the kernel. But um, of course, for example, if you are using um, initial RAMFS, you can, while setting up these mounts, you can always uh, also clear your overlay FS partitions so you always start from, from the same state again. All right, so these were the options. Um, just to summarize, we have basically, we have two different bootloaders. We have two ways for authenticating our root hash namely uh, placing it somewhere in the fit image where it's authenticated or placing it somewhere else but adding a digital signature. And um, also for, for, routing the, for mounting the root file system, we can either uh, let it do the kernel or we can do it in an initial RAMFS. However, um, the, the only way we saw in use so far was um, from U-boot to using a fit image to um, setting up the Inverity in initial RAMFS. And um, what we basically have right now is we have two different bootloaders that we support. Um, we um, have a set, a set of scripts and tools that uh, support the projects in uh, generating and signing the fit images. Uh, we have a couple of scripts that they can add to their initial RAMFS that uh, does that do the mounting and error handling? Because when using an initial RAMFS, you also need to start thinking about um, other ways the system can get compromised. For example, if there were an error in mounting the root file system or something else goes wrong in the initial RAMFS, you need to be sure that you do, are not dropped into a shell where someone can interact with the system in this early boot stage. Um, we have like a couple of scripts that can be integrated into the build pipeline for um, computing the root file hash and uh, for placing it into the initial RAMFS. Um, basically, that's what we're currently providing the projects. Um, of course, there's a ton of stuff that we still uh, want to do. Uh, basically, uh, the real treasure was not uh, the, the files we created, but the knowledge that we gained along the way because um, as I said, right now there's just one, one happy path that, that projects are using, but we want to also document and enable um, all the other options. Um, because this is like all, one of the first questions we get, we also would like to provide a comprehensive performance comparison between all those options, um, especially when it comes to U-boot, uh, sorry, to, to Rust boot. Um, however, while we're working with Rust boot, um, we discovered a couple of kinks that provided, uh, prevented Rust boot from running at full speed. So any performance figures we could have gained from that are not, would not have been really uh, accurate. Um, we still need to, to like, uh, evaluate some, some uh, update systems, see how they integrate with our solution. Um, so uh, the, the projects don't have to do that every time and again 
and uh, like also provide them a lot more documentation so uh, integration goes much more smoothly with less consulting going on. Um, all that is uh, mostly internally right now, but um, once we've reached a state where everything looks consistent and uh, works more or less out of the box, we'll also uh, open source that somewhere probably on Bosch's GitHub. <coughs> and uh, when that time comes, I'm, I will be happy to share the link with you if you get in touch with me. <coughs> Alrighty, that's it for me. Any questions? So one of the problems with Secure Boots is that you're effectively asserting that Secure Boots enables. Mm -hmm. And many SOCs, that's a matter of whether they're fused or not mm -hmm. into having that enabled. Do you have any insight into best practices for verifying that a particular device actually shipped with Secure Boots enabled, as opposed to that somehow being skipped during manufacturing and then it being possible to just bypass everything that way? Uh, that would be lovely. Um, However, um, at this point, we need to place a lot of trust in whoever manufactures these devices. Um, so we just rely on them doing everything properly. Thanks. Uh, just to follow up on that, there are some root of hardware root of trust mm -hmm. projects and, and chips. The Open Compute project has an architecture mm -hmm. um, that we're familiar with in, in the, the cloud side of things. So I think that was one of the thoughts I had was how do you know <laughs> that you're coming up? So I think there's like an assurance and a, a root of trust uh, issue there that is slightly out of the scope of this. Hey, excellent talk. Um, have you thought uh, so far in your research at all about guaranteeing the integrity of a potentially persistent overlay, of those persistent overlays uh, with something like DIM integrity, for example? Um, not yet. Um, that's also one of the many things we have in our roadmap. Um, however, most of these devices we're working with, they're like very low powered and all of the security stuff is just annoyance to, an annoyance to the developers. Um, so it'll be a long way till we uh, have that by default. Thanks. Yeah, I'm working on similar problems. <laughs> like, but so far, anything that um, might get persisted using DM overlay, uh, sorry, uh, overlay is, is um, maybe some configuration data, some settings of your wall scanner. So it's nothing we would execute without looking at. Alrighty. Thank you.